Brunette. Um, you see what's happening in Belfast in these years. It's really in the summer of 1920 that serious sectarian violence erupts in the city of Belfast. And of course, um, it's sparked by rising tensions, the return of the former members of Carson's army uh, who have no jobs in uh, a post-war slump. Um, you have tensions in the workplace in places like Belfast Shipyard. Um, uh, a senior um, uh, police commissioner from Banbridge, County Down, is shot by the IRA in Cork. His funeral makes its way north that summer. Carson makes a, an inflammatory speech in Belfast saying they will not tolerate Sinn Féin. Why is he saying that in the summer of 1920? Because the British government had brought PR in for local elections and Sinn Féin had won three important local bodies for Manor County Council, Tyrone County Council and London Dairy Corporation. And they are determined to prevent partition emerging. So they're trying to cripple partition before it begins. The UVF become active. The IRA are already attacking barracks in the north. And of course, Carson's speech and the assassination of uh, Lieutenant Smythe and Cork, the northern born police commissioner, they spark tensions. Um, something like eight to 9,000 Catholics are driven out of their workplaces and the shipyards and in the engineering firms, as well as some Protestant laborites as well. And they become the expelled workers. There are lots of packs to try to get them back to work. It doesn't really work. And the situation isn't helped by the fact that James Craig is um, undersecretary for the Admiralty at Westminster. And he sends a telegram condoning the expulsions. Well done big and wee yard. So nationalists feel they're not going to have any protection under this new uh, unionist government that is about to emerge in the northeast corner of Ireland as violence, of course, escalates across the country. The next slide, please. Craig's a key figure. He's now turned 50. He has his Boer War experience. Uh, he's the son of a wealthy um, uh, distiller in the town, a wealthy man, married well into the uh, London kind of mercantile class. And he's determined to get things moving in terms of establishing the homeland he always wanted in the north of Ireland. Now, of course, um, it's not until the end of 1919 that the British government turns its, its attention to Ireland. They've been involved in peacemaking in Europe, redrawing the map of Europe. And the Long Committee is set up at Westminster, chaired by Walter Long, a former Conservative politician. Um, and they decide to partition Ireland, two home rule parliaments, North and South, uh, with a Council of Ireland, a weak bond of union, bond of union they talk about linking the two, controlling railways and fisheries, and anything the two governments agree to give. So you have a potential there for an all island government through time by consent. That's the hope. Remember, this is a coalition government, overwhelmingly Tory, but with some liberals loyal to Lord George. And they had been deeply divided on the Irish question just a few years before. So the Long Committee decides on a nine county Northern Ireland. The balance will be better. There'll be a 44% Catholic nationalist minority. There'll be a 56% a Protestant unionist majority. Anybody doubts um, why politicians regard religion as a guide to politics should look at a speech in Oma Courthouse in 1917 by Sir Dennis Henry, uh, an Ulster unionist MP, an eminent lawyer and first Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland. And at that revision session to revise the register for the elections, he said, everybody knows that in the north of Ireland, religion and politics are synonymous. In other words, they are the same thing. And he was a Catholic unionist who perhaps belied that principle, but there it is. So the Long Committee want um, a nine county Northern Ireland. Immediately Craig, who is sure footed in the corridors of power intervenes, and he insists on a six county Northern Ireland. His actual words to the committee, Craig expressed himself against the inclusion of the whole of Ulster in the Northern Parliament and thought six counties preferable. Reason given was that Protestant representation would be strengthened. So a rare example of an ethnic group within Europe rejecting territory because the Slavs and the Danes and the Germans, everybody wanted more territory. Um, the unionists are rejecting three counties, which is a crushing blow to the 80,000 unionists of Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. Joe Devlin, of course, the nationalist leader, a solitary voice at Westminster, um, criticising the government's uh, determined policy to introduce partition. He said, this is the worst form of partition, six counties, and of course, permanent partition. And he predicts, if you like, um, 
a, a grim status for Northern nationalists under unionist rule once they have all the powers that will be given to them over law and order, education, and the judiciary. The next slide, please. Now, of course, this is Walter Long, the man who draws up the act. And of course, another man we don't have a slide for is a man called Sir Ernest Clark. He's a senior British civil servant sent to Belfast. He's vetted by Craig as an imperialist, and he's responsible for setting up everything that brings about this day a hundred years ago. He arrives, Walter Long, uh, sorry, he, uh, Sir Ernest Clark says, I arrived with a table and a chair and an act of parliament. He's an office beside Belfast City Hall, and he's preparing, of course, to set up the new special constabulary, which Craig has insisted on raising to defend his new borders. They're really the Ulster Volunteers, Carson's army, raised to a higher plane. At 32,000 strong by 1922, you couldn't have drawn the border at Ahayan or the Bogside or Timor or, you know, Cullerville without a mass force of specials armed on the border who were not only policemen but were almost auxiliary troops loyal to the new government. Craig regarded them as, as his frontline defenders in this whole period. Lord George, of course, who helped to form them, described this exclusively Protestant force as akin to the fascisti, Mussolini's um, armed bands on the streets of Rome at this time as Mussolini um, prepared to seize power um, in Italy. Uh, so it gives you a sense of the tensions that are rising. Of course, the, the specials were detested by the nationalists who saw them as a kind of a reinvention of the black and tans in the north. And the sectarian tensions rise. You have the IRA are now pitted against the specials who are better armed. Violence is escalating in Belfast and in rural areas as well. And Clark is preparing for elections and the transfer, the establishment of a cabinet and the transfer of power. So all of this quiet work being done in Belfast City Hall is preparations to setting up James Craig's new Northern Ireland state. The next sli slide, please. And here we have a cartoonist take on Lloyd George redrawing the map of Ireland. You see the whole of Ulster there. It was assumed until the very last minute in March 1920, uh, 1920 that uh, Northern Ireland would be the whole province with that narrow um, uh, unionist majority, something which Craig rejected as too dangerous, too problematic. And Lord George, of course, there's the Irish Council, the Council of Ireland, which would never actually come about, but which Lord George is talking about partition. He said, I'm going to cut the map in two and place the two parts in this hat. He's obviously the Welsh magician, uh, the Welsh wizard. And after a short time, the two parts of Ireland will be uh, found to have come together of their own accord. At least I hope so, he says aside. I've never done this trick before. And of course, partition was seen as a temporary solution, but it soon hardens into permanency. The next slide, please. And here you have, of course, we're moving towards the events that day in Belfast City Hall. The election, of course, is held in May 1921. There were to be elections north and south for the two parliaments. But of course, Sinn Féin stood 124 candidates, and it's a Sinn Féin landslide. They buy all of those seats. They create a much larger Republican doyle. Only four former unionists were elected for Trinity College. So the Southern Parliament is a non-event, a dead letter. The focus is in the North. Elections are held in May. And of course, this is a problem for the one third nationalist minority. Uh, from Fermanagh to West Belfast, they had never contemplated partition. And particularly unionist rule, something that Joe Devlin had always feared, would actually um, intensify the um, uh, 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 problem for the nationalist minority in the North. So the result is, of course, they, uh, Joe Devlin, the nationalist leader, signs a pact with Eamon de Valera, the Sinn Féin president, who's also, of course, calling himself president of the Irish Republic, all Ireland in his view. They sign a pact um, to urging their supporters at the grassroots to transfer their votes in this election held under PR, proportional representation. It's a disappointing election for the nationalists. There is a lot of violence and intimidation in East Belfast, but generally in rural Northern Ireland, the election goes ahead fairly peacefully. The problem is that the nationalists and Sinn Féin have a lot of bad blood behind, behind them. Hibernian halls have been burned. There have been clashes between Republicans and Hibernians at fairs and markets and places like, you know, the Moy. And the result is that um, the nationalists vote 
doesn't strength doesn't translate into votes. They only win 12 seats between them, six seats each. Craig sweeps the polls. His slogan was, the Union Jack must sweep the polls. And we face this submergement, as he put it, of the six counties in an all-Ireland parliament. Remember, Craig had met de Valera at the beginning of May. And Lord George had sent him to Dublin to meet de Valera to see what Dev's bottom line was. But the meeting appeared to be a failure. Uh, it lasted four hours. So Craig is ready to establish his parliament. Um, and of course, with some great footage we've discovered recently of this parliament um, being opened, um, it meets in state in Belfast City Hall. The date appointed is the 22nd of June, 1921. Now remember, violence is continuing. Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins are, are haunted men. Um, house burnings are continuing in West Belfast on the very eve of the visit. Um, the IRA killed a policeman, wounded two others a week earlier, and three nationalists are shot dead by what appears to be a police reprisals guy in return, and another 30 people will die in the month after the King's visit. But let's focus on the King. I happened to meet his grandson, uh, Prince Charles, like you do, with historians about a month ago. And he was full of enthusiasm for his grandfather, his great grandfather, who had made that speech. He recalled, of course, that the king had tried to avoid violence in Ireland during the Home Rule crisis at Buckingham Palace in 1914. The king was concerned about the Irish crisis, um, the escalating violence, especially the policy of reprisals. He no, no longer bought into the Lord George mantra that the IRA were a murder guide. I mean, Sinn Féin had won successive elections between 1918 and, in fact, um, uh, three sets of elections between 1918 and 1921. The result is the king wanted to make a speech count and he wanted to go to Belfast in person. He consulted General Jan Smuts. Now, Jan Smuts was the South African prime minister. Um, he had been a member of the war cabinet in Britain. He was a friend of the empire, but he had been a rebel against the crown in the Boer War. He'd been in touch with de Valera through Sir Roger Casement's brother, Tom Casement, Casement, who was executed for his part in the Eastern Rising. And he was encouraging de Valera to seek something less than a republic, dominion status perhaps, and perhaps a divided Ireland as a prelude to Irish unity later on. The King's uh, speech was carefully crafted by a range of people, the King himself, Lloyd George, others, um, and particularly General Jan Smuts. And in that speech, the King called on Irish men to forgive and forget, to stretch out the hand of, stretch out the hand of forbearance and conciliation, and to seek for the land that they loved, the new era of peace, contentment, and goodwill. Now, he's setting the seal on a unionist parliament. There are no Catholics or nationalists there, as Lady Craig says in her diary. They're protesting against partition and will for many a day. There's only one Catholic from the North meets uh, James Craig as he enters the city hall. And he is Sir James McMahon, the Under Secretary for Ireland in Dublin Castle, who was born in Belfast. So the King can say he met at least one member of the minority. It's a unionist affair. And there's triumphalism in the, in, in the town. The serried ranks of hundreds of thousands guarded by police and detectives. Um, and of course, the King's bodyguard of the 10th Hazars around the city hall. But the King's speech resonates throughout Ireland. It has a major transformative effect. This is the grandiloquent gesture. This speech made at 12.30 um, uh, p.m. a hundred years ago this day in Belfast City Hall. Within a few days, the nationalist reaction in the South and the press is favorable. Liberal opinion in Britain is supporting it. And Lord George is beginning to draft a letter inviting to Eamon de Valera to a preliminary conference in Downing Street. He also invites Craig, but de Valera says no, Craig will talk to him as an Irish representative. He not come to London as the leader of a state. That's significant perhaps in itself. Nationalist hopes raise that de Valera is going to undo partition. That's going to be very difficult. And meanwhile, de Valera insists on a truce in the war. All prisoners must be released. There must be no handing over of weapons. Decommissioning becomes an issue, and then it's, it's shelved. Um, and that truce comes into effect on the 11th of July, applying to the whole of Ireland, to Craig's annoyance. It applies to Belfast as well. Um, and soon, de Valera, by the 14th of um, July, is in Downing Street. And those preliminary talks will lead eventually to the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921, which inaugurates the Irish Free State for 26 counties, it recognises Northern Ireland, which is briefly part of the Free State, and so seeks to deal with it with a rather badly framed Boundary Commission. 
the tangled web of ambiguity. Hence the importance of this day. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I want to hand over to the sp second speaker, if I may, Dr. Russell Reese, who is, of course, a historian of this period. Um, he was um, uh, head of history for many years uh, in Oma Academy. Uh, his books are used by students to this day. In fact, he's just revising one at the moment, and I know it will be meticulously done by Russell. And he's an expert, really, also on the, Brit the role of the British government in Ireland in this period. So I'm glad to hand over to Russell as our second speaker this morning. I don't know if you can still hear me. I'm just making sure the transition is smooth. Okay. Hello. No. Yes, we hear you. We hear you, uh, Russell. You go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for that very interesting uh, first uh, lecture. I'm going to speak about the historic meeting between Craig. Sir James Craig and Damon de Valera on the 5th of May, 1921. It was the only meeting uh, between these two great leaders of Ulster Unionism and Sinn Féin. Craig would subsequently meet Collins, Michael Collins, early in 1922. He met him on three occasions and he met uh, William Cosgrave in December, 1925. But these subsequent meetings didn't raise eyebrows to the same extent as the Craig de Valera meeting uh, in May 1921. That meeting took place against the backdrop of worsening violence in Ireland, north and south. The troubles were in full swing in the north, characterized by savage sectarian violence at the time, in May, by May 1921, the War of Independence was entering its bloodiest phase, final phase. So what transpired at that meeting, I think, has amused historians for a, a, a very long time now. Craig was in Dublin. He records, he gives a kind of a dramatic flavor. Uh, it's almost like a Cold War East Berlin. Uh, he's driven around Dublin by three of the worst looking toughs he'd ever seen, he describes them. And they eventually arrive at some suburban house, probably out in Black Rock, where he is taken in to meet the uh, president of Sinn Féin de Valera. The meeting seems to have been cordial. One of the things that comes across is, is Dev is stunned. He's dumbfounded by Craig's devotion to the Union and to the Empire. He, he, he recorded later that Craig spoke of the Union as if it were a mystical thing. Craig, for his part, he subsequently records that he got the history treatment from de Valera. De Valera clearly did most of the talking. And Craig uh, notes that after half an hour, they'd reached uh, Brian Baru. Another 30 minutes passed and they had got as far as some king or other as Craig. He wasn't listening, obviously, too carefully by this stage. And it went on in this vein until uh, a Kerry blue dog enters the room and that gives Craig the opportunity to throw de Valera off the scent, off the track, and the history lessons brought to an end. Craig grabs a piece of paper and scribbles out a statement for the press. And the two men part on good terms. And they actually agree to meet again uh, after the election. The two men, of course, had known each other by reputation. Craig is the Boer War veteran. By 1921, he's been an MP, a Westminster MP, for nearly 20 years. He had been the master organizer behind the campaign of Ulster resistance to the Third Home Rule Bill from 1911 to 1914. And then he went on to have a career uh, in, in government at Westminster. By 1921, as Eamon said, he was a junior minister uh, with the Admiralty in Lloyd George's post-war coalition government. He is, I think, at this time anyway, 
among the unionist leaders, he is probably one who is more able to take a broader view of, of political developments. You might even su suggest that he had more statesmanlike qualities at that time. Now, I admit that's difficult uh, to see Craig as a statesman in view of what follows uh, under his premiership. But at the time, I think he is genuinely concerned about the fate of Southern Protestants. And that continues into the 1920s. And the crucial thing, I think, is he's more than willing to meet de Valera at the time. He jumps at the opportunity, in fact, to meet de Valera in May 1921. For de Valera's part, he's someone who is, I think, closely associated in the public mind with the 1916 rising. He's the senior surviving commandant who had escaped execution. He's president of Sinn Féin, president of the Irish Republic, and someone, I think, who possessed a ferocious political intelligence, but he's not a factor in the War of Independence. This battle that the IRA was waging against the Crown forces in pursuit of Irish freedom at the time. In fact, de Valera left for the United States in June 1919. He didn't return until December 1920. What he's doing there, of course, he's trying to promote the idea of an Irish Republic, trying to gain international recognition, particularly American support for the idea of an Irish Republic. He'd previously suggested that Ulster unions might have to be coerced, but by 1921, he had expressed the opinion that that would not be the way Sinn Féin would proceed. One of the things I think is very significant is the fact that when he returned from the United States, he was not arrested by the authorities who could very easily have arrested him any time in early 1921. But that is, I think, deliberate policy. And it's due to the influence of a peace faction that is operating inside Dublin Castle. A group of, of, of high-ranking officials, Mark Sturgis, Sir John Anderson, and particularly Andy Cope, these men were exploring ways in which they might bring about a settlement of the Irish problem. And I think it was due to their influence that de Valera wasn't arrested because these men had opened channels of communication with the Republican leadership. And I think particularly Cope saw de Valera as someone they could do business with. So I think in their efforts to prepare the ground for subsequent peace talks with Sinn Féin, they thought, and particularly Andy Cope thought, that it would be a good idea if Craig could meet de Valera. As Eamon suggested, that would give Lloyd George some kind of information, uh, intelligence about Sinn Féin's bottom line vis-a-vis uh, -vis its future relationship with uh, the Empire and, and, and Britain. Cope pushed the idea and Craig backed it. The two men, of course, knew each other from working together previously at Whitehall. So the meeting uh, was arranged for the 5th of May. Craig actually had been floating the idea of meeting de Valera for a few weeks for those that were uh, really prepared to listen. The pretext for the meeting, by the way, was a trip that Craig was making to Dublin to meet the new Viceroy who had just been installed uh, in the Phoenix Park in Dublin. Therefore, there was no information leaked to the press about the meeting. And that's one of the things that I, I just want to spend a moment doing, looking at the reaction to the meeting. In Britain, reaction to the meeting was upbeat. The next day, the Westminster Gazette ran a headline, A Gleam of Hope for Ireland. And the first slide, please, Craig. This was the... Uh, This was the reaction of the Dundee Courier, an important provincial newspaper. It's actually got an editor from uh, Northern Ireland at the minute who is uh, working over there. But this was a newspaper that carried an awful lot of comment about 
the Irish question and had done for about 10 years. You can see here uh, a step towards peace, the most important event uh, since 1916. And that was typical of how the news, uh, of how news of this meeting was welcomed in Britain. The uh, report went on to quote Hamer Greenwood, the Chief Secretary for Ireland, who described the meeting as the most hopeful thing in 750 years. Uh, maybe he should have been meeting de Valera when he was thinking in that kind of time frame uh, and not Craig. Yet, of course, we know nothing was agreed at that meeting. It was simply an exchange of views and the press reaction in Ulster, I think, was much less optimistic. The second slide, please, Craig. This is the uh, Belfast newsletter on uh, the 6th of May, the following day. Its headline reported on the uh, election campaign, which was now in full swing for the new Northern Ireland Parliament. It had just got underway. It also comments, as you can see there, on the conference with de Valera and it expresses confidence in Craig, confidence in, in the unionist leader. It also puts a unionist spin on the visit. Craig had been visiting Lord Fitzalan, the new Viceroy, and then out of the blue, it claims uh, it was suggested that he meet de Valera, who wanted to meet him. Uh, and the newsletter goes on to report that Craig met de Valera in pursuit of peace. You know, while his duty was to lead Ulster, the newspaper was claiming that uh, Craig was always willing and prepared to try and promote peace in Ireland. And yet here, the, the, when you go on and read the rest of the report, the newsletter is really glossing over the very serious concerns raised by Ulster Unionists about the meeting. Number one, his colleagues had not been consulted. Now, where have you heard that? Uh, before, in fact, recently about the, a, a unionist leader. They were angry, they hadn't been consulted. If they had, of course, they wouldn't have been, a, they wouldn't have, have approved the visit. And the, the third slide, please, uh, Craig. This is uh, the headline from the Freeman's Journal, the nationalist newspaper, the supporter, the organ, if you like, of the old Home Rule Party. Uh, and this is a more accurate view of how uh, Craig's unionist colleagues in Belfast reacted to the meeting. Orange men jumpy over de Valera interview. They certainly were nervous. And this report highlights the reaction of, of one MP, Samuel, Samuel McGuffin. Now McGuffin was the MP, Westminster MP for the Shankill Division in Belfast. He was also a candidate in the forthcoming uh, Northern Ireland parliamentary elections. And he warns supporters uh, in, uh, uh, his supporters in North Belfast about the way the political situation is developing. I mean, this is uh, a report, he, he's, he's uh, making this speech on the evening of the fifth. News has just broken of the meeting between Craig and de Valera. And McGuffin states that the political situation had altered very considerably within the last few hours, but he hoped not disastrously for those in the northern area. He was speaking at this election meeting just after receiving news of the Craig de Valera meeting. So what, this is, I think, a much more accurate reflection of the way unionism uh, interpreted what had gone on. This came out of the blue to them uh, and they were nervous, they were concerned about, about what Craig might have said to de Valera. What we have to remember is that Craig is a new leader. He'd only been leader of Ulster Unionism since the 4th of February, longer than 35 days, I know, but uh, the, the circumstances uh, in which he becomes leader at the end of January, Craig uh, found that Carson had declined the premiership and he was the next man, the obvious candidate, and he was installed as leader on the 4th of February, but he remained at Westminster in his capacity as a junior minister at the Admiralty uh, until the 21st of March. 
And he only comes back to Belfast in late March 1921. And it's quite interesting to note, Lady Craig, who was a, a, a famous diarist, uh, that's how we know so much about what Craig was thinking and doing and, uh, and who was influencing him, et cetera, at this time. She records in her diary that on that 21st of March, she had never seen Sir James as downbeat as he was that evening when he had to hand back the keys of his locker at Westminster. Uh, it, you get the impression this is a reluctant leader who had taken uh, the position uh, as leader of the Ulster Unionist Party out of a sense of duty. And for many unionists, I think the fallout from his meeting with de Valera is an early test. That's how they see it. It's an early test of his capabilities as a leader. The fact was, and this is quite interesting, Craig summoned all the candidates, the 40 candidates who were standing in the uh, upcoming Northern Ireland Parliament elections to a meeting in the old town hall in Belfast, the old headquarters of the UVF on the 6th of May, the following day at 11.30 that morning, very different from the last couple of days, they didn't summon Craig, Craig summoned them and he explained what had transpired in Dublin. He told them there had been a frank exchange of views. He also gave them two guarantees. He said there would be no more concessions by Ulster Unionists after the Government of Ireland Act. That was the last. Unionists, you see, still claimed that the partition settlement with the Belfast Parliament was a concession made by them. Secondly, there would be no further discussions with de Valera. But it's interesting to note, as the slide indicates, that here is a new unionist leader who's looking over his shoulder, looking over his shoulder uh, because there are more militant people that he's leading, uh, very quick to criticise any kind of rapprochement with the leaders of, of Sinn Féin. What Craig did was he told them from now on the Council of Ireland would be the forum for any future contact between uh, Belfast and Dublin leaders. One of the things that uh, surprised me when I started looking into this actually was just how positive Craig was at that time about the whole concept of the Council of Ireland at that time. Uh, fifth, fourth slide, please. Uh, this is after the weekend and uh, newsletter readers wake on that Monday morning and they're greeted with this kind of Old Testament theme, Daniel and the Lion's Den. It emphasized Craig's personal courage in going to Dublin in the middle of this mayhem, the War of Independence to meet uh, de Valera uh, and it, it, uh, claimed that he had silenced his critics over the weekend. It reported Craig's view, and Craig had said this at the weekend, enough has been said about the meeting in Dublin. He didn't want to hear any more talk about it. He repeated his claim that the meeting with de Valera had done what he said was immeasurable good. De Valera was now fully aware of the union's position, and Craig insisted that any future attempt to bring peace to Ireland no matter where the, the impetus for that came, had to involve him as the leader of the Ulster people. Now for me, that demonstrates that Craig is alive to the danger of the British government negotiating with Sinn Féin over the heads of Ulster Unionists as they look towards uh, bringing in some kind of political settlement with the South. In fact, Craig had made his position very clear at an election rally after they left the old town hall, big lunch. Craig prepared for an election meeting in Hollywood that night. And he told uh, the, 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 his followers in Hollywood that night that de Valera now understood Ulster's determination to maintain its ties with Britain. Adding that if he got a big majority uh, in this election, he would defy any authority 
whether it be the British government or de Valera, to take away the Northern Parliament once it was rooted in Ulster soil. So by now, for me anyway, it's clear that the existence of a Belfast Parliament, which unionists had maintained they didn't want, would be a vital bulwark uh, in their campaign to preserve the union. The slide five, please, Craig. This one is familiar to everyone, the partition settlement, uh, the six counties uh, of Northern Ireland that was agreed. The background here, of course, is, as it says up at the top, the Government of Ireland Act. Home rule had been on the statute books since September 1914, but had been suspended. And the understanding was that a new piece of legislation would be required before the end of the First World War, which meant actually before the last treaty was signed. So they were still within the allotted time frame, but they had to get a move on. The committee, as Eamon explained earlier, established under Walter Long, actually Carson's predecessor as leader of the Irish Unionists, uh, met for the first time before the end of 1919. And in their preparations for a, basically what was a fourth Home Rule Bill, it was decided and agreed that partition would be at its core. I suppose from late 1913, early 1914, some form of partition seemed more likely. I, th I think a development that Craig was much more comfortable with than Carson. Anyway, the Government of Ireland Bill proposes two parliaments, one in Belfast, one in Dublin. But as Eamon said, as far as the South was concerned, it was irrelevant. So the 1920 Government of Ireland Act was really an attempt to settle the Ulster question. And the key to the legislation is the area uh, defined as Northern Ireland. Long and members of his committee favour nine counties, Craig, as we've heard, wanted six counties, and Craig would prevail. As it shows you there in the slide, it left Unionists in Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan on the outside. Something that was very difficult for them to take. These are people who had signed the Covenant in September 1912. They had formed their own units of the UVF in 1913, 1914, but now they were being excluded from the new Northern Ireland state. It was a numbers game and Craig was crucial uh, in, in ensuring that it was uh, six counties, not nine counties. The other key element of the bill was this Council of Ireland. Uh, the idea that representatives from both the Belfast and Dublin parliaments would meet and that would facilitate future unity. And I honestly think that Walter Long was genuine in uh, his belief that that's what would transpire in the long run. There would be some kind of, of, of unity situation. And as we've said, or I've said earlier there, certainly in May 1921, during that election campaign, Craig's speeches confirm his intention to make the Council of Ireland work for the benefit of Ireland as a whole. He said that on a number of occasions. But what surprises Long and his colleagues uh, who are drafting this Government of Ireland bill, I think is the speed and the enthusiasm with which Craig embraces the idea of a Belfast Parliament. Remember that's something that they'd previously been hostile to. Long himself believed this is quite interesting. He believed that creating a Belfast Parliament uh, would reduce criticism of partition in, in, in the United Kingdom as a whole. That, that's, you know, you, you, that's maybe just how out of touch uh, the man charged with this responsibility was. But I think the spectacular rise of Sinn Féin uh, convinces Ulster Unionists that having their own parliament would give them greater security. And by the way, they're much quicker to appreciate that than their, their colleagues at Westminster. Uh, Craig then uses his contacts, his influence at Westminster to maximum effect. So this is the settlement which sets up the uh, 
elections, which we have uh, the announcement of the results on the 24th of May 1921, the Unionists won 40 of the 52 seats and the other 12 are divided between the Home Rule Party, the IPP and Sinn Féin. Then with the King's speech at the opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament, has, as Eamon has suggested, uh, the Lloyd George government changes course almost immediately. The door is now open for Lloyd George uh, to negotiate with Sinn Féin. And the fact that Craig, Orange Craig, you know, the, the uh, absolute uh, stalwart leader of Ulster Unionism has already met de Valera, you know, a couple of months previously. That removes any stigma uh, about talking to Republican leadership. So it's crucial that the meeting has been crucial uh, in that sense. But by the time the truce is agreed and the truce uh, comes into force on the 11th of July, the important thing to note is the Belfast Parliament is a fact. It's up and running. The truce is quickly followed by talks in London. Lloyd George invited both Craig and de Valera to those talks. De Valera objects to Craig's presence and Craig anyway, he declines to be involved. Instead, uh, what de Valera did, he invited Craig to a, a meeting in Dublin where he would accompany Southern Unionists where, and I want to quote him here, where he would like to confer with you and to learn from you at first hand the views of a certain section of our people of whom you are representative. And for Craig, that was too much. Uh, I'm very angry Craig rejects any such invitation by this stage, he had his Northern Parliament and he would defend it. De Valera, from his point of view, he sees the problem uh, essentially one to be resolved uh, by England and Ireland. Uh, and that uh, becomes, I think, very clear, not just in 1921, but that's a, very much a factor in 1938 when he meets Chamberlain. Uh, before the beginning of the uh, Second World War, uh, when the two men negotiate the Anglo era agreement uh, in April 1938. That's very much still uh, de Valera's thinking. What quickly becomes clear, uh, actually, at the talks in July after the truce and in the treaty negotiations, which run from and drag on from October to December 1921 is that Sinn Féin is much more interested in sovereignty than it was in Irish unity. And I think no one reflected that more than de Valera. Essentially, at the time, 1921, Sinn Féin is a southern movement. So in the treaty negotiations, what happens is the Sinn Féin delegation tries to use the existence of Northern Ireland, the existence of the Northern Ireland state, to force the British into granting Ireland greater freedom. It's making use of partition. Remember, de Valera is not there. But Arthur Griffith, I think, and Michael Collins both did press for Irish unity, and that proved a headache for Lloyd George. You know, the famous statement that you could raise an army to fight for crown and empire in Ireland, but not for Ulster, was very much in the forefront of Lloyd George's thinking. Partition was difficult to defend. And there was, of course, a limit to just how much pressure Lloyd George could put on the Ulster Unionists when he relied uh, on the Conservative Party uh, for support to keep his government, his shaky coalition government, in power at the time. Of course, it's the Boundary Commission that gets Lloyd George off the hook. Indeed, the Boundary Commission is crucial uh, to the treaty. It persuades Collins and Griffith to sign the treaty, both fully anticipated that there would be significant uh, alterations to the border. Uh, and after maybe some kind of Versailles-style plebiscites, that's what the two men expected. It certainly, I think, Article 12 that Eamon referred to, uh, it was vague, yes, but it shocked 
Craig. It worried Craig and it certainly made unionists in Tyrone and Fermanagh very, very nervous. Of course, violence was still raging in the north and it wasn't just confined to Belfast, as Eamon suggested. I mean, rural uh, parts of Ulster, particularly Tyrone and Fermanagh, were experiencing very serious violence at the time. The pressure was on Craig to do something about the security situation. The truce, while it held for the 26 counties, it did not hold for the six counties in the north. Uh, and that led Craig to meet Collins early in 1922. The two men met on three occasions, and there were two famous pacts. The one on the 30th of March is particularly famous. What they were trying to do was Craig wanted to bring an end to the Belfast boycott. Collins wanted Catholic workers reinstated in the shipyard, etc. There was some talk that the two men could settle the boundary question between them. But as uh, Eamon said, when Craig went to Dublin uh, on the 2nd of February 1922 and saw the map, Collins's uh, vision of what a slimmed down Northern Ireland state would look like. I mean, he, he threw the toys out of the pram. That was enough for him. The English press, by the way, were speculating that these meetings might lead to unity. And that was another thing that spooks unionists in the North. They're, they're, uh, Craig again comes under criticism uh, from his followers for meeting Collins in these circumstances. What they didn't realize, I think, was that the big winners in the treaty were the Ulster Unionists. Uh, both Craig and de Valera, I think, should have met there. That should have been their second meeting. They should have met in London during the treaty negotiations, but neither was present for, for different reasons. The Craig Collins Pact, that attempt to settle the, uh, the violence, and overcome many of the hurdles that existed. It didn't hold. It was gone and as, as loyalist and, and Republican violence quickly overtook it. Subsequently, the electoral pact that uh, Collins and de Valera uh, agreed in May uh, 1922 infuriated Craig and he responds, and I'm going to finish with this, with a famous speech to the Northern Ireland Parliament in which he said, we'll hear no more talk of a boundary commission. What we have, we hold. So their meeting of the 5th of May, 1921, did not lay the ground for any kind of, of uh, reconciliation between North and South. What happened subsequently actually is the outbreak of the Civil War lets Craig off the hook, releases the pressure on Craig, and that is very important in helping to cement partition. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, absolutely, thank you very much indeed, uh, Russell. Uh, tremendous talk, plenty of uh, food for thought there, which we'll be able to um, mull over for the next 10 minutes because we're taking a comfort break now. Um, 